can you run when you don't know the way of the Spirit? Oak House Church brings to you the word of life which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. So today, we are going to be looking at um, another, another topic. And what we are going to be doing today is um, the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> Remember Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. Okay, Galatians 5 22. He said, but the fruit, not fruits, but the fruit of the Spirit is, not are. The fruit of the Spirit is, not are. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. This particular topic is... You know, all the courses in the maturity class are six credit load because they are voluminous. You can't just stay in one hour or two hours and discuss the character of God. It is absolutely impossible. Because the fruit of the Spirit is actually about the character, the nature, the personality of Christ. This is what defines God. Now, he said, the fruit of the Spirit is force, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. It is the same approach. When you read Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, he says... And the, there are seven spirits of God, okay? He mentioned the first one is what? The spirit of the Lord. is one of the seven spirits of God. In the same way, he mentioned love as uh, the first. <clears throat> I'm going to explain why. When you talk about the spirit of the, of the Lord, the seven spirit of God, actually what it means, I will not have time because it's not within the scope of our teaching today. I just want to use it to give an example of what I want to say about the love and joy and all of that. That is the fruit of the spirit. The seven spirit of God is actually what he's talking about. What he means is the glory of God. When you see that, when you talk about God's glory, he's talking about the seven Spirit of God, the manifestation and the expression of the sevenfold manifestation of God's Spirit. He's talking about His glory. So, that the first mentioned there is the Spirit of the Lord, is the Lord Himself, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, when the Holy Spirit shows up in a meeting, His presence. It is his presence that radiates. It is his presence that does all those things. In the presence of the Holy Ghost, when the glory of the Holy Ghost shows up, the glory of God, which is the Holy Spirit, it manifests in the midst of the people. It manifests in the life of the people. There is something that happens to you when the presence of God shows up. It's the Holy Spirit that comes. And then, when he begins to manifest his glory, he manifests and expresses it in a way of wisdom. And then understanding. And then knowledge. And then counsel. That is his glory. The way he sees the, the if you see the if you see that is why the Bible says when God wanted to create from before the creation of the world, before the creation of the world began, he went for wisdom. And that through wisdom he was able to do all the things that you see him do and all of that. That is how he created the trees and the plants and all of that and the animals and the mountains and the hills and all the creation of God. You can see they speak about his glory. It is his wisdom that made it happen. 
It is his understanding. There is nothing that you want to do today that God does not have an answer to. That is when you have somebody expressing, manifesting the wisdom of God and all of that, you are like, wow. It becomes a beauty to behold. So that is the expression, the glory of God, the Holy Spirit. He shows up and then he begins to express himself. How can you run when you don't know the way of the Spirit? Oak House Church brings to you the word of life, which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. In verse 16, he mentioned God is love. So that love is a person. <clears throat> and then he expresses himself, his character. He expresses his character in these different aspects, which are, number one, which are what? Joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self control. These are how he expresses it. Now, see, it is in a whole bunch, it's like a bunch of fruits, okay? Just like the Bible says concerning the Ten Commandments. <coughs> Excuse me. In the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments is not old though. It's still till today. It still applies till today in the New Testament. Because a lot of people think that the old command, uh, the Ten Commandments is past. And all of that. The Bible said that the Word of God lives forever. These are God's Word. It's not man's Word. So it lives forever. And so, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments came as a whole he was given as a whole not in part so what it means is that if you if you the ten commandments if you fail in one if you're guilty in one you are guilty in that is what the book of james said please give it to me find it for me <clears throat> Galatians, i mean james chapter James chapter 2 to them, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in how many? He is what? Of all. Did you see that? If you keep the whole and you have found wanting in one, you say you are guilty of all of them. You have not committed adultery. Okay, but you have stolen. You say you are guilty of adultery, but you have not committed the act of adultery. But you are you'll be accused of, of that adultery. Do you know why? Because the whole law is one together. You can't single out one. You say I am doing this, then the rest. The same way with with the fruit of the spirit. So you cannot say you love God. You love God and then you are impatient. You are quick tempered. You are impatient with people and with anything. You are even impatient with God. But you say you love God. You are guilty. You the whole is it has to be holistic. Do we understand it? Are you sure? Okay, so having said this, the fruit of the Spirit is the mark, is the evidence that this person is a Christian, that you belong to Jesus Christ. This is what makes you divine. It's not the faith that makes you divine. It's not the power, because there are two aspects of God. There is the power of God and there is the glory of God. 
when the character of God manifests, that's the glory of God. There is this aspect of God, the character of God, and then on the other side is the power of God. What makes you divine? What makes you look like Christ is not the power, but the character. Because you can have the power this and still be like the devil. Hello? You remember our popular scripture in Matthew 7, the Matthew 7 people. They have the power, great works that were done. I was reading the other day. He said they did mighty works. Yet Jesus said, depart from me because I do not know you, O you workers of iniquity. And many will say to me that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name we have cast out devil, and in thy name done many wonderful works, wonderful, amazing work. But yet Jesus will say, Go, I do not know you. What matters is a character. Not so that is what makes you divine because character is the nature of God, is the personality of God. That is actually what God wants to develop. And if you build character, the other one will surely follow. It becomes easy because if God commits his anointing in your life, if he commits that anointing on your life, he knows that you are you will use it in accordance to his purpose you are not going to use it to destroy his purpose so the fruit of the spirit is a mark of the christian character that is why he said in matthew 17 15 he said by their fruits in matthew 17 uh, matthew 7 15 i 7 15 if you go up Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. 16, say, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistle? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth what? Good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And a good fruit cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And of course, in verse 19, he says, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is done what? Is hewn down, cut down, and cast into the fire. If you don't produce this fruit, if you don't, that is why he said, Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling it is your duty this fruit is inside of you the holy spirit because it's the fruit of the spirit of the holy ghost is the holy ghost that bears that fruit not you you cannot cultivate that fruit you cannot produce that fruit is the holy spirit that produces it in your life so now it is your duty to ensure that that fruit that you bear fruit that that Holy Spirit is bearing that fruit in your life. It is your duty to make sure. So in verse 20, he said, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence, but also only, but now much more in my absence, walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. So Matthew 1 First John, of course, First John chapter 4, 8, he tells us that God is love. So, this is who God is. God is love. Remember I said that God, that love is a person. And it's that person that manifests. So, we're going to be looking at the first aspect of the character of God, which is love. You see how God, how the, what the love of God actually means. And then you begin to see the other expressions of God's love. And what it means now, before I do that, you see these nine fruits, <coughs> these nine of them, that is the most important thing in your life, to produce these fruits. And what you are going to do, if you are going to produce these fruits, what you are going to do is that you are going to take them one by one. 
you pick up the first one you have to understand and study and know what it is and then you begin to cultivate you begin to pray you begin to cultivate it you begin to desire it you begin to work it out when you have found out that you are now walking in love at least you have stepped on the pathway of love you have found that pathway and you are because there are depths just like the bible said there are breadth and length and depth and the height of the love of god i won't have the time to deal with it the four dimensions of god's love is a lot so when you find that pathway you stay on it you start walking that way when you have started it then you pick up the second one the second one is joy you have to find out what joy is and how to cultivate it in your life and then you walk on it and you walk on it and you walk on it when you find out that you are now on that path of joy of the lord and all of that then you pick up the next one which is peace you begin to find out what it means to be at peace what it means is how to bear the fruit of what does it mean and all of that and then you begin to work it out when you find that part where you begin to work it out and then you pick up another one when you have come to the end you go back again in the beginning that's what you keep because that is what is going to occupy the rest of your life when you stay on this path you see how your life will blossom that is what it means by transformation transformation is that somebody looks like you looks at you now he can see you expressing the love of god he can see the joy of the lord in your life he can see the peace of god that passes all understanding in your life he can see good words coming out from you he can see faithfulness he can you cultivate each and every one of these you lose it down and find out what these things are and then begin to cultivate it that is how to attain the full stature of christ if you don't take time one after the other specifically one by one you will not get there and remember it is something they go together there is nothing like um that is why if you if you if you um if you love god it's possible for you to love god and you're not faithful Because you can love God, after some time you backslide. You stop doing what you are doing. You are not steadfast in that your love. You backslide. Faithfulness is not there. And then, and Jesus said, it is only those who endure till the end that shall be what? So you can't start from the beginning, then halfway you drop and say it is well. It's, no, you will be cut off. That is why it is dicey. It is the absence of this kind of training and all of that, the absence of it that is producing the kind of wayward people that we have today in the body of Christ in the, as, in the name of Christians in the, and in, in the name of church. Or the people are not taught and trained. Okay. Of course, in the Galatians chapter 5, 23, it says, that the fruit of the spirit are beside outside of the fruit of the spirit there is no other law so if you want to fulfill the whole law it is found in the fruits of the spirit if you walk in the spirit if you are in the spirit then walk in the spirit you fulfill the whole law so if you concentrate on cultivating these virtues in your life So I say that the fruit of the Spirit is the key. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the fruit of the Spirit is the key to the highest attainment in Christ. It is the road map to the highest attainment that is the full stature of Christ. What is the full stature of Christ? The full stature of Christ are of two. Like I said, the first aspect of the full stature of Christ is the power of Christ. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sovereign. In Ephesians 1, he says, 
that I may know the hope of his calling and that I may know the exceeding greatness of his power that is at work in me. Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's a king. He rules. He has power. That is one aspect of his glory. Then the other aspect of his glory is the seven spirit of God manifesting the seven. When he said that I may know his power, that I may see his power and his glory. You are talking about the manifestation of the spirit, the seven spirits of God. So the key to attaining them is through the fruit of the spirit. And that is what he tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18. Ephesians 3 18. Maybe that we may be able to comprehend with all sin what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and height. Verse 19. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of, of God. To know no, don't go to 20. Just stay on 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God is the... I say the fullness of God has two aspects. The power and his glory. But the key to getting there is the fruit of the Spirit. So as you are cultivating the fruit of the Spirit, you are going to begin to see the glory of God shown in your life. You are beginning to see the power of God display in your life. So we now go on by one. That's why I said it's a nine, is a six credit load. I'm going to take them one by one. What is love? <clears throat> when you say, I love God, when you say, I love my wife, <clears throat> when you say, I love my brethren, what do you really mean in a practical sense? In a more practical sense, when you say love, what does it mean? Now and watch, love is not a feeling. Love is not an emotional thing. Love is a verb, is an action word. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> love is an action word. It's not, uh, it's not an adjective. It's, not, it's a verb. It's an action. So it is what you do in relation to people, in relation to any other person around you. And the first thing that you do about love Love has, you know, love is God. God is love. He has a power. He has everything he can do. And you don't question him. You don't ask him questions and all of that. And he does everything he wants to do because he cares for you. Now, if you see the aspect, see what love is. Give me First Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> Verse 4. First, not second. First Corinthians. Love does what? What does love do? This is def the definition of what love is. Love suffers long and it is kind. Love suffers. 
when you say I love someone, what it means is that I'm ready to do what? To give up my freedom, my liberty. I'm ready to give up what is at my disposal, which is my right for your own good. That thing that you are giving up is not palatable, is not sweet, is the flesh doesn't like it. You give up your right, you give up your privilege for another person. That is what love is. Give me Romans, you come back to this. So he said, charity suffered long and is kind. We're going to be looking at them one by one, but let's look at love now. Give me Romans chapter 14, verses 15 and 17. But if thy brother be grieved <coughs> with thy meat, for example, you want to eat meat, and your brother is grieved about that meat Meat could be what you want to drink, what you want to eat, any kind of food or whatever it is. You want to eat your right. There's nothing wrong about it. Uh, you bought it with your money. You have the right to eat it. And God has said there is nothing that God created that is unclean, including, including snake, including uh, dog. Everything that God, there are people who eat millipede. You don't think so? You don't know? Eh? Until you get to China. Don't worry until you get to China. Those who have been there will tell you the kind of thing those people eat is unthinkable, is unimaginable. And they display them in the market. And they eat it, they've not died. Somebody say, if thy brother being grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with, with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Verse 16. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Give me NIV and go back to 15. Give me NIV of Romans 14, 15. For, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, if you want to eat something now, and your brother or your sister says, but this thing that you're eating is your brother and all of that. He said, this thing that you're eating is not good. Oh. Ha. And he finds fault with it. What do you do? Is your right to eat that food, is it not? So what do you do? You give it up, you stop it, don't eat it for his sake. Not for your sake. If you have faith, keep that faith to yourself. But for the sake of your brother, because of what you're eating, and he says it's not right for you to eat it. Don't go about and say, because I have faith, you don't have faith. That is, uh, he said, remember the weak. So what do you do? I will not eat that food. I will not drink that thing for the sake of that person. That is what is called love. You are helping that person's faith to grow, to, to come up like your own. You don't go and destroy that person. Say to hell with you, you don't. If, for example, somebody, you know what Paul did? He said, to the Jews, I became a Jew that I might win them. So he came to the synagogue, to the temple, and it happened that they had to shave his, his head. What did he do? Shaving hair or not shaving hair, does it have anything to do with Christ and the gospel and your salvation? The answer is what? No. But what did he do for their sake? In order to win them, in order to help their faith, he went and bobbed his head, Golimaba. That is what is called law. You give up your right. 
you go somewhere to preach the gospel and all that, and you find that, you know this one is saying, hey, love, love. You go to one place, well, one guy, he went to a place to preach the gospel. Guess what they were eating? They were eating lizard. It was lizard is their stable meat. They caught it. I ate lizard though. <coughs> when I was small. And the meat is sweet. When I was small in the village. You can't condemn such a person. You go to a place where you want to preach the gospel and you find out that it is snake they are eating. And they give you the snake. You say, ew, ouch. You know what you have done? You know what you've done? You have rejected them. You have torn their... You don't have love. You don't love them. If you love them, you will identify with them and eat that thing that they are eating. You will not die. They've been eating it. They didn't die. For their sake... So you have a rethink for those of you who say, I want to go and preach. Paul did it. Jesus did it. That's what it means, love. You give up your right. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Or let's stay here. Stay, stay, stay in Romans. Give me Romans chapter 14. Go to verse 1, please. <clears throat> Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not with doubtful disputation. Give me NIVs and be fast, please. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on his disputable matters. Okay? One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only what? Vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Verse 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand for the Lord he is able to make him stand. In the issue of eat what you eat and you don't eat. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind so that you will not condemn those who believe in Sabbath that is only on Saturday that we worship God. That is their own belief. They hold on to that Sabbath that is Saturday. There is nothing wrong with it. They are convinced. That's what the Bible says. But you that believe that every day is holy and sanctified and you worship God just like we do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the days. And those of us who are so religious believe it is only on Sundays. So whatever you believe, you believe it on your own. There's nothing like it is who say that if you don't worship God on the Sabbath day, that is sin and all of that. See it, what is written concerning that subject. So you can choose any day. You can choose Tuesday and let Tuesday be your Sunday. And it is on Tuesday that you come to church and you worship God and you do all of that. And then on Sunday you go to work. There is nothing wrong with it. Hello, religious people. They are looking at me somehow. That's what the Bible says. But then choose the day that is, you, that is acceptable to you. Which one have we chosen? On Sundays is a worship day that the world all over, those who believe, this is our belief and all of that. And we is acceptable to God. Because there are people who are preaching against it and they say that we are not of Christ. That we don't observe Sabbath. 
And then you say the Jewish calendar, the Jewish people and all of that, that they are Sabbatarian and they, they do Sabbath. I should go and worship Sabbath with them. I should go and be doing Sabbatarian with them and all those Sabbath. No. That is their belief. And it is acceptable to God with them and all of that. Then my own is on Sunday. You should respect my own. I respect you. We are one. Be convinced in whatever it is that you want to do. And then follow it. There is nothing wrong with it. That is a love. So you understand one another and live in peace and in unity. This is what makes for peace. <clears throat> Except, of course, when, when, when you tamper with the foundation of the faith. When you tamper with the foundation of the faith, that is where the problem is. And what do I mean? When you now say that Jesus Christ is... Um, That Jesus Christ is a, is just a wise man that lived. One of the wisest man that had lived and all of that. That is not, he, he wasn't, um, there is nothing like virgin birth and all of that. They, somebody said that Jesus Christ is a brother of Satan. That Jesus Christ is, um, is a young, is, um, is a, the senior brother. Satan is a younger brother. That is a younger brother that was misbehaving. There are all kinds of things they have, they've said and all of that. If you tamper with the basic foundation, Jesus Christ, Paul say, I have laid the foundation and that foundation is Jesus Christ. I have laid, let no man lay no other foundation except that which has been laid, which is Christ. And anyone that is building on that foundation, which is Christ, you have to be careful with what you are building. So that's where the difference is. If you're building with chaff and all of that, I will not identify with you. And if you tamper with the foundation, I will not identify with. If you don't, if it's a question of uh, um, these people, they cover their hair and all of that. I don't have any problem with you. That doesn't make you a more Christian or not less Christian and all of that. If it is a church that cover their hair and all of that, so be it. If this, that is what they believe, let it be. Follow the. If you want to go to their church, cover your hair. Don't say eh, for twenty years, and then ch that child finally came at the 20th year and then this god turns around and say come and sacrifice him and he say oh, yes lord yes lord let your will be done yes lord i will say yes how do you sing that song again how many of you will say yes indeed because we sing it in song it's not easy it suffers love suffers that's the meaning of love <coughs> So I say love chooses to set aside one's own preferences, your desires, your need. You put the other person first before you. That's what Jesus Christ did. For let this mind be in you as it was also in Christ. Who though was, was God, did not count it robbery to be equal with God, but did what? Humble himself, made himself of no reputation. He give, gave up his rights, his privileges. He gave it up for the sake of us all. That is what is love. That is why the Bible says, in this God commended his love. He commended his love. This is how God commanded his love. This is how God defined his love. This is how God showed us his love. How? He gave us himself. Though he was God, he didn't count it robbery to be what we do. So that is one thing you know about love. He sacrifices. He makes sacrifice. And there are dimensions of this sacrifice. Love can give, give up his life for your sake. That's why the Bible says we lay down our life for one another. Love can give his best. He gives his best. You don't give second best. When you want to give something, that is why when you want to do something for someone, maybe you have clothes that you're no longer wearing. And I'm not saying that you should go and bring your clothes, the, your best, whatever. But if, you, if, it, if, God, if God tells you to do that, you do it anyway. 
But if I want to, I have clothes that I'm no longer wearing and all of that. What do I do? You just go and carry it as it, put it inside the cellophane bag and send it to the person. Is that what you do? That is wrong. That's not showing love. You know what you do? You take them to dry cleaner because you don't wear it like that. Will you wear it that way? The answer is no. So how do you do it? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That thing that you do for yourself, do it for that person. So what do you do? I will send those clothes to dry cleaner. They will dry clean it. When they dry clean it, I will bring it, package it like that, and then you give it to that person. It was in the, it's in the book of Malachi. God says, if you call me father, where is my honor? And then when you want to give God, when you want to honor God, you now go and um, they want to give uh, thanksgiving. You go to the farm, you look at this goat, you see this one that is blind in one eye. He said, bring that one. See the other one that is, that is walking like this. He said, bring it. And you give it to God. God now asks them a question through the Malachi prophet. He said, if it is your governor, will you give him a blind goat? Will you go and give him the one that is, he leg is bent like this? Will you do that? The answer is no. So love gives the best. You want to give the whatever. You look at, among all your flock, the animals you have, in, you look at the fattest one. The healthiest one, the biggest one. You give God the best. <clears throat> the same way when you want to give offering. If you don't know, select the money, the ones that are clean. Know the person that you are giving. The, you are not giving to the man. You are not giving to me. You are not the... He said, whatsoever you do, do it as what? As unto who? Not as unto the pastor. Not as unto your wife. Not as unto your husband. Not as unto the church. Whatever you do in words or in deed. Do as unto God. It's God that you are giving it to. We must, we must have to reshape in our mindset and all of that. So I look for the best, the cleanness of the money. I put them together. I can go to the shop and give you dirty one. Or the one that I want to give to God, I must select it. They are clean. Sometimes if I have opportunity, I will tell them, those of them that work in the bank, please give me a hundred thousand naira clean note. I will keep it. From there, I will be giving my offerings. It speaks of something. Because you want to give God the best. That cloth that you are giving to that brother, I hope you know it is not that brother you are giving it to. Who are you giving it to? It's God. You are not giving it to Michael. It's not Michael. Michael is a physical person that you are seeing, but the person indeed you are giving that in is God. So do it as if you are giving it to God. So what kind of thing will you give to God? Time for offering. This is what his hand will be doing in the pocket. You know what he's looking for? And these people, they are used, they, when they touch 1,000 Naira note, they will know the difference between 1,000 Naira note and 100, 100 Naira note. That's what they will be doing in their hand. And once they bring it out, it's exactly 100 Naira note. How they know, I don't know. That's the one that he will put in the offering. Then tomorrow you want God to honor you. You are joking. Far it be from me. If I don't honor those who, what does it mean to honor? Most of the time it's not really on, yeah, the quantity is also counts. The quality of your offering counts. The quality of what you are giving to God. 
even the quality, if this is the house of God and all of it, the quality of the ambience is not just, it's not that it's going to be, you know, touched up, uh, you put gold everywhere and all of that. No. Let everything be in their perfect positions and all of that. And then let every fan be. You know what is beauty? Beauty is, the definition of beauty is ugliness that is put in their particular positions and places. When you open the bonnet, go, you know your car, Pastor John. Remove the bonnet, remove the fenders. Then hit the road. People will see that your car, you inside, they will think he's a madman driving. Because he's ugly. But when you put back the fenders, put back the bonnet and all of that, everything is fine. You say, wow, I like this car. It's ugliness that is put in their particular place. That's what makes when you see women, when they wake up in the morning, if you want to know a, a beautiful woman, I'm sorry. Catch them on our ways in the morning. But when they come out from that their house in the morning around nine ten o'clock. If you see them, they actually look at takeaway. But meet them in the house. <laughs> you see what they will, if you you now see what is they are carrying on the head, the real state of the head is beauty. Packaging. So love give the best. For God so loved the world that he gave his second son, one and the only, he gives the best. And the extent to which he can give it is even to the extent of giving his life. Love does so. That's what the meaning definition of love. That's the first expression. God, when God shows up now, God is love. That is what he shows up. That's what he does. He's ready to lay down his life. He's ready to give up his glory. He's ready to, to make himself of no reputation at all. Hey, that is the reason why those of you who have been able to have an encounter with Jesus Christ, either in the dream or he appears to you, those of them, you will always see him in his simplest form. It's not that if he, if he wears the glory, the fullness of his glory, if he shows up in the fullness of his glory, his glory is the glory of his presence is brighter than the sun. You know where he, you know where, you know what happened on, to Saul on the way to Damascus? You know he, the light. Where was the light from? In the air. The light is from the air. It was from heaven. They just parted, he just parted the curtain where he was staying. He just parted the curtain to look. The light from his countenance got in touch with him. He blinded him. How many millions of miles? But he doesn't show up like that to us. When he comes, he says, when you see me, you will not recognize me. I, he comes like a poor man. He comes like a sick man. He said, I was sick in the hospital. You didn't come to see me. You see the simplicity of Christ. That's why he's not in your, you, you, you are dressing. That's why James was condemning that kind of lifestyle. He said, when they come to church, those of them, when they come, you carry them because they dress in a God, in a, in a gorgeous apparel. They are well dressed. You see the, you see the combination and the outfit and all of that. And then you put them on the front row. He said, but the people that do such things, they are evil. You have judged the people already. You have condemned those people already before God. And he said, it's an evil heart. So I said, love can go to the extent of giving up his life. 
We see it in the scriptures, 1 John 3, 16. He laid down his life, so we ought to lay down our life for, for him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. You lay down your... And guess what? When you live this kind of life, you make this kind of sacrifices to people. God shows up. You see the manifestation of the glory and the presence of God in your life. You know, when you see a beggar on the road, you want to give him money. You want to give him money. You look for 15 naira, 10 naira. If, he's, if there is 5 naira, you would have given him. 20 naira, 15 naira. The highest is 100 naira. How many of you have given a beggar 1,000 naira? Bring out 1,000 naira notes and give to the person. Okay. There was one day, I've done it a couple of times. I see them, they came to the window. I put hand, they have, I have 500 five, five, five naira. I gave the other one. If you see the excitement, he went and showed the other one. The other one rushed, he came, I gave him. Another one, he got excited, he told another one, he came. I was giving. So I noticed that that is what they, I had to start my car and move. I've done it a couple of times. Train yourself. You see, that is why when you understand this, you stay on this one now first. And you pray, oh God, you have shared this love abroad in my heart. Give me the grace to express it. I want to know the love of God. To know it, you are looking for, you are asking for the knowledge. And now you are getting that knowledge. It is now to put it into practice. You ask for the grace to enable you to do it. Because you can do it. You can do all things through Jesus Christ. This thing is inside of you. Is to express it. So when you have done this now, when you have spent time, one week, two weeks, three weeks, working on it and putting it into practice and taking how far so far. It's not that you're going to become it overnight because to bear fruit, it takes a long time. You don't bear fruit overnight. You don't plant seed today and tomorrow you have the harvest. The least it can take before you start seeing the fruit. If it's corn, it's three months. And the longer the time to bear the fruit, the more expensive and the more valuable. If it is vegetable, you plant on the ground today. After one week or two weeks, you harvest it. How much do you sell it? But if it is corn, you plant it after three months, you harvest it. You know how much you're going to sell it. The longer, the more the value. So you spend time. That's why you have to have patience and keep cultivating, keep working on it. Because this is the will of God. This is how you become more like Jesus Christ. Which is the ultimate of what we are doing. This is the vision of the church. To become like Christ and is in the fruit, bearing the fruit. So that is the reason why First Corinthians 13 8 says, Love never fails. If you if you if you manifest this aspect of God's character, you will win every man, every woman, no matter how hard. If that man cannot be win, cannot be won by love, if that person you are doing this cannot be won, then it means that that person is uh, the son of perdition in the first place. It means that that person is a heretic. He's a son of perdition. But first of all, manifest this aspect of God's character. Let it be that that person did not accept it and all of Don't just say, eh, eh, these people are not serious. Because you were not serious with your, yourself in the beginning. Okay, is that clear? So we go to the number two. Wow. Jesus Christ. Joy. <clears throat> what is joy? 
It is the inner rejoicing, the, the joy, the rejoicing that comes from the inner being, innermost being. Despite the outer circumstances, despite the circumstances of life, despite all the things that are going and everything is collapsing right in, in front of you, things have gone bad. Yet, there is a joy that is coming from within. It is a deep nourishing satisfaction that continues even when life situation seems empty and unsatisfying. Everything. You see the difference between joy, another word for joy is glad. That's why the Bible said, David said, I was glad. That is, I was full of joy when they say, let us go to the house of God. Joy defies every circumstances of life, every situation, everything that this life throws at you. Joy defies it. It will never be put down. You will never be worried. You will never be sorrowful and mourning and wearing a very large big face. It can only be from God. That is one of the fruits of the Spirit. That is why it is your strength. Joy is like, um, is a horsepower. Is a horsepower. Is a power that drives you through situations and circumstances. That is why he said, when you go through the waters of life, the troubles of life, when you go through that water, you will not be drowned. When you go through the fire, you will not be consumed. It's law, is joy that pulls you all through. It's the joy of the Lord. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you talk about the strength, the inner strength is actually a joy. That is what he said concerning Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17. What happens? Although the fig tree shall not blossom, give me an NIV. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the store, is using a man that is into agriculture farm farming animal. He uses him to give an example. Your own could be your business, it could be your marriage, it could be your career, it could be anything. Everything and they are happening side by side. All at the same time. Just like it happened to Job. Yet the Bible says Job did not sin against God. The wife said to Job, curse God and die. And he refused. He was full of joy. How did it come? The world cannot, cannot offer it. That is the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness depends on the natural, the physical things. You got a promotion in your office. You are so excited. You come to church and give testimony and even give offering and thanksgiving. You get breakthrough in your businesses and all of that and you are so excited. These are physical things. Where the true test is... The true test. Because as long as everything is working fine and all of that, God is good all the time. As long as your bank account is green. When they say God is good, you can say that again. Yeah, right. Can somebody say you, you uh, God is good all the time? Why you are shaking your leg is because you just got a promotion. You just received an alert. 79 million naira dropped in your account. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You now know that you can attend prayer meeting. Now let it be that that whole money is gone. Thief now came stole the money, shot your daughter in one leg and wounded. And then you are carrying her to the hospital, you jump into a trailer that is coming. Batter the car, you manage to save your life. 
will you now still say the Lord is good all the time will you say that no it means you are what you have been using is happiness that is dependent on physical things you see you see the difference that is why he said you buy their fruit you know them by their fruit fruit of what love fruit of what joy that's how you know James chapter 1 verse 1 he said James chapter 1 verse 2 actually okay James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations greetings Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials and many of many kind. Consider it joyful. Rejoice. I'm going to show you how you gain to cultivate all this. You'll be above situations and circumstances at all times. Let me bother you. Let me not bother you with much scriptures. So I say like joy is the horsepower that drives you through every obstacle of life and they show that praises and thanksgiving flourishes unceasingly in your life. That's joy that does it. Sorrow and heaviness of heart stand mute. They can't talk. Sorrow and heaviness in the face of joy, they don't have any expression at all. That's why he said in Isaiah 61 verse 3. In Isaiah 61 verse 3, look at what he says. He said, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called the oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his people. You can give me King James Version. He brings it out to well. <coughs> King James Version, verse 3, please, fast. He said, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, and give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. So you don't mourn. If you see someone who is mourning, he doesn't have joy. You see someone who is grieving, he doesn't have joy. If you have joy, there will be no place for grieving. If you have joy, there will be no place for mourning. I know something happens, maybe you lost your husband or lost your wife or your child or your loved ones and all. Yeah, there is that, um, okay, you know, just as a respect. Because it's not a wood or good that died. Somebody that had been with you and all of that, you felt for him. The, 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 that, that, that emotional whatever is just as a result of the fact that I will not be able to see that person face to face and all of that. That is just what, and it's just a temporal thing. But deep inside you, you are excited, you are happy. You are not weighed down by it. The, that's why the Bible said that we don't sorrow like the world. As if to say that is the end. We have hope. And it's that hope that make it not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. That hope does not fail. That's what the meaning, it make it not a shame. That is, the hope of the Father we're going to see again is a genuine hope. We're going to see him again. We're going to see that your loved ones again. So it doesn't fail. So because of that, I am full of joy. I know it's a function of time. We will meet again. So I'm excited, I am happy. But you see, when you have that joy, people out there will misunderstand you, they will misinterpret it. Because we are not on the same plane. Let's go to the next place. Peace. What is peace? He used the word tranquility. He used the word rest. There is a rest inside of you. You are not agitated. You are not fretting. You are not worried. You are calm. You are together. You are quiet. You are not perturbed. You are calm in the face of all the dusts 
that the devil is raising. That's why the Bible calls it the peace that passes all understanding. You can't understand it. In the face of trouble, you are calm, you are quiet. That is even when he said, be still and then you know that I am the Lord. Be still and know I am the Lord. Be quiet and calm in the face. So that is even when you can hear God clear. I'm not perturbed. I'm not carried away. But hey, this one is... And then you lose your peace. You lose your patience. You lose every virtue. His inner calmness. His inner quietness. It comes from within. You are not bothered. They said, hey, this one is happening and all of that. Hey, okay, let us pray. You pray out of fear. You pray out of anxiety and all of that. You think you are going to impress God? You don't. Be calm. They told Jesus Christ that Lazarus, your friend, is dead. <laughs> he said he's sleeping. And he continued the work he was doing. Three days later. Is it three days or four days? Four days later. He said, let us go and wake him from... Hey, Jehovah. Well, how can one get this? Is what the world cannot offer you. Look at this man called this man of Galilee. What kind of human being is that? He was in a boat. Today, boat is is plane. Maybe you are in the air flying. Maybe you are in the car, and then the car skidded out of the road. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood, of, hey, 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 the blood of Jesus. And then if it is in the plane, they had already died. But look at Jesus Christ. As calm as everything. You know why? He knows in whom he believed. Paul said, I know in whom I believe. Do you know? Do you know? These these are virtues. They are what they are fruit of this. They are all inside. This is what this is what makes you a mystery to the rest of the world. They can't relate with. They don't understand it. You know there are people out there. Your mates, your colleagues. If the amount if the amount of money in the account is maybe ten million naira, they will lose sleep. They will, be, they will start. They are irritated. They are worried. They are anxious. They are all that. 10 million naira. The money has depleted up to 10 million. But you, are, you don't even have up to 10,000 naira in your account. And you are normal. And you are smiling. Mark chapter 4 verse 37 please. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now what full. Verse 38. And he was in the hinder part of the... Give us NIV. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciple woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Yes, 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 please. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to them, to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Verse 40. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So it is having confidence that God is able to take care of of your life, of every situation that comes. There is a knowledge of God that you have that gives you that peace and calmness. You are not worried. You are not perturbed. You must get to that point because that is how God wants you to live your life. And when you begin to manifest these fruits, 
your neighbors who are unsaved, they will see you and they will wonder what kind of life is this? Is this not this man that his business has collapsed? This one happened to him, the other one. He's still happy and he's still rejoicing and he's even praising and shouting the name of the Lord and all that. And he's excited. Where is that his peace knowing that God is in control? He's being confident that God is in control of one. First Peter 3 14, please. Fast. Fast, please. First Peter 3 14. But even if you should suffer for what is right, do you you are blessed? Don't do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened because of that. Be at peace. Be at rest. My peace I give to you, not as the world give I give I to you. Hebrew chapter, Hebrew thirteen six, Hebrews thirteen six. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be what afraid. What man can do to me? You threaten me, you do this, you do that, you kill me, you do whatever. I'm at peace. I'm not worried. Uh -uh. Didn't you hear what? You know what they were saying to Jesus Christ? Didn't you hear what the high priest, what the Herod is saying? He said to him, No one, you don't have that power to do anything to me. Because his quietness and composure and all of that is mind-blowing. You are telling somebody you are going to kill him and send him to prison and all of that. The guy is quiet. He is not worried. He is not agitated. And you won't see it in his face. He is calm. He is like a baby. Such virtues, they don't come from this world. They come from above. Father, give me Genesis 13.5. Anyway, it's about the story concerning Lot and Abraham. God was the one that called Abraham. Because of Abraham, Lot, his um, nephew, became so wealthy, so rich. Now, there was a problem between Lot's headsmen and Abraham's headsmen. And they were fighting. And then Abraham called the Lord. He said, you know, we are brethren. We are brothers. We don't have to fight. Peace. You know what? Even though I am the one that God called, and it is through me that you became rich and all of that, I have the privilege of choose whichever direction that you want to go. Look at the whole plane. And Abraham and Lot now saw this other part. And he chose. It was when Abraham, when Lot finally left with his shepherds and his flock, when he finally left and God said to Abraham, look up. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed, they are blessed. Blessed because you are a peacemaker. Patience. This one is a lot of a lot of people don't like stress. Patience, another word for patience is long suffering, is endurance while you are suffering, is ability to endure persecution or ill treatment. When you are treated bad, when they speak evil of you. Patience number one is that something bad is done to you. Okay? Something bad is done to you. You have the right to fight back, to speak back, to react. But you chose not to react. You are patient. Long suffering. 
something was bad done to you. You chose not to react. And you chose not to react. You didn't give any negative feelings. You didn't recall. You didn't give the person silent treatment. You didn't withdraw your services to the person. You are still okay. You are seeing as if nothing happened. You know how you are telling somebody, you did this and you are walking and talking as if nothing happened. That's how you are reacting. You are patient with the person. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2. Ephesians 4 2 please. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, giving up your rights. Do not, they did something bad to you. Patience, they did something bad to you. They said something. When men curse you, when they abuse you, when they use your name despitefully, when they despise you and all of that, what do you do? What do you do? When they curse you, what do you do? You don't, did they say you should recall and then give them silent treatment or don't speak to them again or keep malice with them? No. He said, when they curse you, bless them. When they gossip against you, pray for them. Jesus said to them, Lord, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. That is Christ. Colossians 3.13 Colossians 3.13 Please, you have to be fast. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You see, you have to just let go. You have to patient. It's not that they, something, somebody must do something bad to you. Say something bad to you. Treat you in a way that is demeaning. Or, you know, things that are not palatable. You, they do it to you. They say it to you. They castigate you. They defame your character and all of that. What do you do? You pray for them. You bless them. That's long suffering. That's having patience. Another one is that one who has the ability to exercise revenge instead exercise restraint. You withdraw. You first Peter chapter 2, verse 23 said, When they slapped him, when they hauled their insult at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. You have the right to do something about it. But you say, you're not going to do anything that is stupid. You just keep yourself. And then you come out, you are still normal and clean towards those people. These are the kind of things that breaks people's hardened hearts. When you do something, I told you, it's a true life story. It's not a joke. It happened in real life. Somebody went to preach. They used it. He told them not to, to. The guy that we are drinking told him that you are disturbing us. And he continued preaching. And then the guy brought out his bottle and break his head. And blood, the head was broken and blood was gushing. He didn't fight back. He didn't haul abuses. He uses whatever, clean the blood and all of that, reduce the flow of the blood. And when he finished, he said, hey, Sorry for the delay. As I was saying, The guy that was drinking broke down and started crying because he could not understand this. That thing is what is called the glory of God. <laughs> you see what is called the glory? No shouting, no whatever. It's the fruit of... That's why he said love never fails. Can we get to that point? That love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. He is there. Imprisoned. 
There is no man that this love cannot break. The only man he cannot break are those of them who are children of petition, who have written from the foundation of the earth that they are just they are people like that. Patience means giving people opportunity to make mistakes so that they can change and become better and grow. Give them opportunity to make mistakes. Don't have a kind of people relate with people and so you are impatient with them. The more you are impatient with them, what is going to end up being, if you are not patient with them, what you are going to be getting in return is eye service. Because they will be doing everything in your presence to please you. Because they don't want you to shout or do all those things and all of that. So once you come, once you, they hear that you are coming, they just adjust themselves and, uh, and do all those things. Then when you leave, they go back again and go. That's what you are going to get. You have been raising monsters without your knowing. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. First Thessalonians 5, 14. <clears throat> we, and we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with what? Have you seen it? Warn those who are idle, those of them who have decided to be idle and do nothing and be loafing around, warn them. That's not being patient with them. Warn them. Encourage the timid, those who are cowards who don't have faith. Be patient with them. How long will it be? Somebody came to me and was telling me something and all of that. And I said, the same thing that Jesus Christ, the kind of experience he had. He said to them, how long? Because the you know, woman brought a, his daughter, I mean his son. He had an um, evil spirit that is causing him to fall down and fell into, fell into the fire. and all. He brought, She brought him to be cast out by the disciples of Jesus. But they couldn't. So when Jesus was on the mountain, he came down and the woman brought the son. I said, your disciple could not do this. He said, he was angry. He said, how long will I be with you? You have no faith. What kind of human being are you? But he said, have patience with them. They are the ones that finally turn out the apostles of the Lamb. See the great ones they did. Patience. When we have patience with you for three years, because he was with them for three and a half years. After three and a half years, you don't have patience. <laughs> I, will, I will not improve on the work of Jesus Christ. Patience waits. He gives you time, he waits without looking for an alternative outside of God's promises. He will not. He will wait. If God has promised it, if God has said it, he's, he remains immovable. He waits. After you have done the will of God, you have need of patience. Hebrews 6.15 And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised, patiently. In Hebrew 10, 38, he said, you have need of patience after you have done the will of God. Patience is a virtue. Thirty-nine. You can find it in that scripture. Let me move to the next so I can take, the time is... The next one is kindness. What is kindness? He says someone is so kind. This guy is so kind. What does it mean? Acting for the good of someone. Doing everything for the good of someone. 
regardless of what they did, you are still kind. Regardless of what they did, you are still showing them kindness. You are still doing what you have been doing for them. And that is how God is. Regardless of what he said, regardless of what he did, I will not withdraw my services. I will not withdraw my support. I will not withdraw the money that I'm giving him. I will not withdraw those encouragement I've been giving him because of what he said to me, because of what he did to me. That is being kind. Remember he said, love is patient and kind. So kindness is not that you did something nice to someone. That's not it. Is the surface kind of is the type that the world also does. I hope you know. But when you do something bad to them, will they still be kind to you? So that is why he said, by their fruits. That's how you judge. So those guys who say, you know, uh, this person is just a, you, when a lady wants to marry an unbeliever, you say, ah, he's so nice. So he's so gentle. He's so kind. He's so kind hearted. Eh? You know, he even come, he, he come to the office. He will leave his office. He come and even though the other day my boss was uh, delaying and, and he was in the car and he was quiet. He didn't even complain. I waited. He, took him another one hour before I came out and he carried when I wanted to apologize he said no 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 don't worry it's my pleasure that's how you know he's kind you are being deceived that's not kindness it's the kindness of the world let it be that He saw you with another guy. It could be somebody that is close to you, your relation or whatever. He misunderstand it and all of that. Or maybe you'll be calling him on the phone. He didn't pick his, your call and all of that. A whole lot of things happen. Then he said, no, I'm sorry. Now he said, oh, okay. Then you'll be waiting for him in the evening and after close of work to come and pick. Five o'clock, you look through the window, nowhere. Six o'clock, you look through the window, nowhere. Where are you now? He didn't pick your call. Is he say kind? You know those things, those signs you keep seeing in the beginning before the marriage, before you say yes, even when you have said yes, your engagement and he bring it, he starts showing his true colors. Wrong. What did I say? Run. Mm -mm, not run. Flee. I said, hey, I did it. I thought, I thought when I got married to him, he would change. You know how my pastor, Pastor David, <coughs> What now finally made him marry his wife? He proposed to marry her. Women. He proposed to marry her. And then, somewhere along the line, he saw yellow purple. Very tall, slim, fair, speaks well, come from a very good family. The background of the family, they are rich, are very responsive. If you see the girl, he dumped this first one and went for that one. So it happened that that was the period I was sent to Abuja to go and plant a church. So she herself, that has been dumped, finally went to Abuja to do her youth service. So I was in Abuja. She has finished her youth service anyway. And she has started, he got, you know, just doing runs because that's what Abuja is all about. So when I came to Abuja, she came and joined me 
in planting the church. At least her house was what we are using for fellowship. So when I got to Enugu, Pastor, I was giving him the breakdown, the way I did it. So I mentioned CCC, what happened? He said, am I serious? I said, yes. He went and told his pastor, then, his pastor was, let me not mention the name. He went and told the pastor, the pastor said, what are you still waiting for? Drop this yellow purple and all the leave her, this is the one that is genuine, and go for her. That is a person that is kind. Kindness. That's why after all the storm and every, it's not that you're not going to have issues though. But at the end of the day, the person still stays. These fruits, you don't buy them from the groceries. You don't buy them from shop rights. If you go to buy, if you go to shop right, if you doubt me, go. Tell them to sell kindness to you. Because you want to buy kindness, you will see it. They don't sell it today. <laughs> it comes from a bow. And you don't buy it with naira and kobo. Neither do you buy it with dollar or pound sterling. So when they put pressure, tried your patience to see what you do and all of that, you are still nice. Give me um, Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Please fast. Romans 12, 20. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, do what? Is your enemy you? He has done something bad to you. What do you do? That is kindness. If he is thirsty, do what? Give him to drink, something to drink. In doing this, what do you do? You heap burning coals of fire on his head. But don't go and be doing it for the purpose of burning, putting coal of fire on his head. Because that's what a lot of people will do. There's no more love. Leave that one for God. Twenty-one. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? That is kindness. That's what is called kindness. Love. You see, love is the one that be, he expresses himself in this different way. Have you seen it now? So, you see, love, you don't show love to those who deserve it. They don't deserve it. You see, give it to them. If you give it to those of them who deserve it, then there's no more love. Because that is what the unbelievers do. They love those that love them. They greet those that greet them. Then when you see somebody, hey, this person doesn't greet me. He sees me, you will just pretend that uh, that's why I'm not looking in his direction. That's why I'm not going to include him in this thing. I'm going to show him that I am. You are not kind. And you know, like I said, it is a whole. The fruit is complete. You don't single out one and leave the other. They are the same side of the same coin. A kind person is a friendly person. He's friendly to people. That's why he said this person is a pleasant person. He's a kind person. Romans chapter 12 verse 10. <clears throat> Go to verse 10 please. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. You see what he does. He's a pleasant person. He's friendly. He prefers others to himself. He does not push himself over other people. He does not impose himself on others. He takes the back seat and allows the people to have their expression and prefer them to himself. Those who exhibit kindness are those who you call, you say they are compassionate. People who are 
who have compassion. That is what is called compassion. He had compassion on them. They failed. He still went ahead and did what he did for them. That's what it means by compassion. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. Therefore, as God chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourself with what? Passion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Give me Luke chapter 6, verse 35. When you do something for someone and you are not expecting anything back in return, that is kindness. When you open the door as a gate man and the man drives in and all of that, you, didn't, you don't start saying, your boys are here. Thank God, but your boys are here. You do something for people for the sake of doing it. You, don't, you are not expecting it. Look at what he said. But love your name, enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything what back then your reward will be what? Great. And you will be sons of the Most High because he is what? Kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. That is what kindness is. You do something not expecting that every little thing you do, you wait for to collect. That's what the people that walk around us and all of that, both in the church and elsewhere, in the quarter there, and the brethren and all of that, they are members. And they will finish, they will wait and collect their own money and put it inside the pocket. I'm not saying that you don't, but it's not everything. When you do something, you don't, is, you don't wait to collect back. Is God that reward? That is why, if you don't understand the reward system, how God does this? We got born again as far back as now. When I, you know, I used to tell you, I gave my life, I collected it, and then gave him back. Finally, that was in 1990. I started serving. I never, I did not know that God can bless somebody for serving Him. I did those things were not in my head. My own words. I was just doing it because I just love. Man, I was, I did, I've not heard the message about prosperity and all of that. This one, the message of when I came to know that God will even bless you when you do all these things and all of that. I think it was when we, maybe 1990, 19, 2000 or 2000, when I went to Abuja to plant the church and all that, I wasn't expecting any blessing. I didn't know that God was going to bless you and all of that. I went all the way to, did all the things that I did. Nobody gave me one naira and all. And I, I was just excited and keep thanking God for the opportunity to, I was so happy. Kindness is doing something for giving people something, doing something for them, not expecting to receive. Do we have such things anymore in the in our society, not to talk about, because the church is the light of the world. So when you come to church, every little thing, they will wait and collect more. If you don't, if you, if you tell them to clean this thing and all of that, when you finish, they are waiting for you. No matter what little, and it's something that they can do without, or they want to collect that. Even when they do what they are supposed to do, what even those of them that are being paid, to do X, Y, Z. They will do it and then be expecting. And if you don't give them, that's what they say, tips. When you don't give them, they will plan for you. So next time you are coming, you are coming in, you will say at the gate and be blowing on. They will say inside there, whatever, and be looking at you. They won't come and open the gate. Until you blow and blow and blow and blow and blow your horn. They will reluctantly come and open it. And when they open the gate, they won't open it wide. They will let Okay, let's move to the next. Goodness. Are you getting something? What is goodness? Goodness is the things that you do, the things that you say with your mouth, you do your deeds. 
the good works and all of that, the works you do and all of that, you do it with a clean heart. That's what is called good. Moral excellence, moral uprightness. Your heart is, is genuine. You are doing it with the right motive, with the right intentions. That's why you say, well done, good and faithful servant. The works that are going to be approved are the ones that you did with a clean heart. Give me, um, and includes even the, you speaking the truth from your heart. Give me um, Psalm 15 verse 2. Please fast. Psalm 15 verse 2. He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow. This is what is called good. That's why you say this is a good man. This is a good person. This is a good thing. Give me a... Can, um, King James of it. And give me verse 2. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness. Righteousness is what you do. Is what you do. So he does righteousness. He walks uprightly. The things that, the, how he lives his life, he lives a life of honesty. He's honest with you. He is not pretending. He's not a hypocrite. He's clean. He comes clean before you. He doesn't have ulterior motive inside that thing. That, you know women, again, forgive me, marriage. Unbeliever. He said, you know what they normally say? He said, every man, every woman has a price. Have you heard it before? He wants you to know his price or her price, you will get her. So, what is your price? They will lavish you with goods. They will buy this and buy that and buy that and buy that and buy that. And what is in their heart for doing that is to catch you and sleep with you. And once he does that, he will use all those gifts. That is what is in his heart. His heart is not pure. His heart is not clean. Those works, those works he's, he's doing, they are dead works. They are not good works. So he keeps doing it and doing it. He can wait patiently until he gets you, woos you up. And then you relax. And then he sleeps with you. And then the moment he does that, he abandons you. And then he goes and discusses and be telling his, bro um, his friends and all of that. And then when you discover that this is what happened, he said he broke your heart. You didn't break your heart. You are the one that broke his heart. You broke your heart by yourself and broke his own. Good works. You see, that is why he said by their fruits. You shall. When you know these things, being able to... So when you say somebody is born again and somebody comes to marry you that's why when god is saying marry those of them that are born again he said hey, but i married him he's born again when i married him oh shut up your mouth what about these fruits did you watch that? because he said by their fruits you will know the one that is you see hello you know when you hear people you say i was praying and the lord so and the lord told me that this is my wife I will know that I'm just talking to a very big, fat baby that doesn't know his right from his left. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you heard. I don't care what you heard. The Lord spoke to me. This is my wife. Thank God for your life. I base mine from the word. The word. Pick it up. He will give you... The word, your word is a lamp unto my feet, is a light unto my path. 
He didn't say the spirit is a lamp and a light. He said your word is a lamp unto my feet. What is lamp? Lamp deals with what you used to see every area to see the things around you and all of that. What is lamp unto your path, your destiny? Is a word that opens up all this. So if I want to know a woman that is of God, that God wants me to marry, I will observe that person from a distance. These are the things I'm going to be checking out. Kindness, goodness, patience, the fruit of the Spirit. To know whether he has, he or she has discovered that part. Not that you have attained. Hello? Not that you are now perfect. No, Paul is saying, not that I am perfect yet. But one thing I do, I have discovered that part. I am pressing. I am on that part. I am pressing. I'm walking towards that. Not because the person is fine. Not because of the, the person has money and is giving you money and is buying gifts and all of that. That thing is very deceitful. That is why he will shower you with all those gifts. When you finally get married and settle down, you see a different person because those qualities were never there before. He has never cultivated it. He may be born again, no? but he has imprisoned God in his life, imprisoned love in his heart. Yeah, again, yeah, he's, uh, he's born again. I married a born again. He was born again oh, when I married him. Oh, I don't know what has come up. And they say he's born. Didn't I marry born again? What is the result? Haven't you heard them say it? Didn't I marry born again? Well, you are carnal. The man you marry is carnal. Both of you are carnal plus carnal is equal to. <laughs> Clap for yourself. Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 2. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 5, 25, verse 2. What does he say? 25, verse 2. Second Chronicle, Amaziah. He did what was... And he did that which was what? Right. Did, did, good deeds. He did what was right in the sight of God, but not with what? The intentions of the heart were wrong. The motive of the heart was wrong. God judges the motive. But man judges the outward. God judges the inside, the motive, the reason behind what you are doing. You are winning soul. The reason behind what you are winning. Are you winning soul because they say they are going to give you 100,000 naira? wrong motive whatever you do it must be motivated by love yeah we're going to give you more but that is not the issue that is not the reason why you are doing it they give me or they don't give me i don't mind i'll keep doing it right motive it is that is what is called good that's when you say this person is good why is he giving me that money because there is a trap Okay, let's move to the next so that we can... The next one is faithfulness. What is faithfulness? Being consistent. Consistently consistent till the end. I am consistent in this thing that I am doing. I don't just start it today and then two days later, one month later, I have abandoned it. You are not faithful. If you begin to live your life like that, there are so many things that will be left undone. The kingdom of God will never advance beyond you. you. You become a bus stop. Anything that comes to you ends.
you hear about great falling away. Why the great falling away? They started well, but they didn't press on till the end. Give me 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, please. You are faithful to the faith. No man that worried entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. You don't entangle yourself because if you entangle yourself, you break your call. You break that assignment. You get distracted from that assignment and you will not complete. There are so many baggages and all of that that are pressing and that's the reason why you don't get... You see, if you want to serve God, if you want to serve God, this area must be dealt with. If you have not dealt with it, you are not ready for... You are talking about maturity. Maturity is not for children. You may have been born again 50 years ago, but you are still not mature. You may be coming to church and be singing in the choir. You may be preaching, but you are not mature yet. If you are going to be faithful, one thing that you must do, if you have not done it, you cannot be a faithful servant. You know what it is? You see those your father, you see those your mother, you see those your children, you see those your brethren, and all those whatever colleagues and your friends and all of that, all those where you must draw a line. Because they are the distractions. You see those your businesses and those your careers you are pursuing and all of that. That is why in the one of the, the, the nature of the of your Christian service is first of all, you must understand who you are serving and why you are serving him. He died for you. And it is not in those things that you are holding on to and all of that. He came to Peter after the death of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. He said he appeared to them because Peter had gone back to fishing. You see the distraction, the cares of this world. That is why he stopped what he was doing, the call of God upon his life. Jesus Christ had mercy on him and had to come back to restore him back to faithfulness, back to that same business. He said, Peter, 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 how many times did I call you Peter? Three times. Do you love me? He said, yeah. He said, do they? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? He kept warning him. At the third time, he was angry. And when they saw him, when he showed up, because he had gone back to fishing, they caught nothing. And Jesus said, cast your net, boys, for a catch. And he spread his net, and there was a very big catch. The Bible says he recognized that he was the Lord. He dropped everything and run, ran after him. And when he came to Jesus, and Jesus called him, he said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? See, take my sheep, feed my lamb. In other words, you see this thing that you are pursuing and all of that, they are nothing. If I want to do it, I would. It doesn't take God, it doesn't take you fasting and prayer for God to. Oh, you know those things. He said you are fasting and praying for breakthrough. It doesn't take Him, no. You don't need fasting and praying. You don't. What you need is to be servant of God and remain faithful in service. Well done, good and faithful. You will deliver to you the good of this world. He said, anyone that have come after me, come to me. I forsake father, land, mother, brother, sister. You see the things you forsake. And come for me and for the gospel. So you need to lay those things out. If you don't keep them away from your life, you can never be a faithful servant. No matter. When it matters, you will dump Jesus. You will dump him and dump his work. When the time comes, when the tide comes. When they told him, when he came to follow Jesus, he said, but I just lost my father. He said, forget about them. Because that is distraction. Let me just go and say bye-bye to them. He said, forget it, because that is distraction. Let me follow you. I don't have house, I don't have beds, have nests, foxes have holes. I don't have a house. It could be a distraction. The things and the cares of this world. Until you make a decision on this area, you can never follow God. You can't serve Him faithfully. Your faithfulness will be divided. Why are the women and men sleeping around and all of that? Unfaithfulness. Why? 
because of what this person can offer, but because what this person can bring on the table. Because this person did X, Y, Z for me. That's why I'm rewarding him with my body for what he did. Distractions. Until you come to a point of decision, you can never be a faithful servant. Never. It is those of those when you see what, what when you say somebody is trustworthy, what it means is that you commit something into his hand, that person will deliver this good and is faithful. He will give you that job, he will do it, and he will continue doing it. Give me second Peter, second Timothy chapter two, verse two. Please just be fast. I think I have one more. Is it one or two to go? All the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to who? Who shall do what? Be able to do what? Teach others also. If they commit that job into your hand, if they com commit that department into your hand and all of that, is it going? He said the people that you are going to commit things into their hand are those of them who are faithful. Fool. How do you know those of them that are faithful? You don't, it's, you see, one thing is that most of the time we go to God and be disturbing God and all of that, but he has given us the guidelines. If you study the word, if you study the Bible, if I want to know who is faithful and all of that, I will check your life, I will, those little, little things, how you are sent to come and do this and all of that, you keep giving excuses, excuses as to why you will not do this, excuses as to why you will not do that, and all those excuses. You remember, they say the kingdom of God is like a man who wants to throw a feast, a banquet, and he told his servant, he said, go into the street, invite these people, invite those big men and all of that. And he went and invited them. They started giving as to why one says, I just got married. I'm still with my honeymoon. I can't come. The other one says, my business, I just made an investment and they just called me now. I have to be away from town for about two weeks, about one month. The other one, he said, you know, I, I have just booked my flight and all of that. I'm going on vacation and all of that. I cannot come. They give, and their reasons are what? Very valid. Legit. What did he say to them? He said, go into the street. Invite the blind, the maim, and all of that. Get them, let them feed it. He said, none of these ones that we are invited, none of them will partake of my feast. They will never partake of it. You know what it means? They will never share with me in my father's kingdom. Hello? That is why mat his maturity, you know, is hard bone. It's very hard to chew. It's not for the babies. So that God cannot come. God, before God can commit something into you, he will know that you don't come and be giving excuses on why. How can you give God excuse? You, you know, because you think you are serving Pastor Fred. You think you are doing me a favor. You think it is church. I don't know what is in your mind. Let's know the person that we are serving. We can, I cannot obscure, obscure the cross. It's Jesus Christ. See him. I am serving him the way you are serving him. My own is to teach you, to train you, to show you how these things are done. I look at me. I am doing the same thing. I'm not saying one thing and doing another. I have a profession. I am a veterinary doctor. I studied veterinary medicine in the University of Nigeria. Six years, I graduated. My certificate is still there. During my school days, I had a testimony from a man. He said he studied. He, when he finished, he got his certificate and all of that. He said he, he tore it and burnt it. So that he will never have the temptation to go back and do his profession that he wants to follow God. He was doing it on purpose. I didn't say he should do so. Because I did it. I said I was going to do the same thing when I finally graduate and get my certificate. But I finally graduated, got my certificate. I didn't burn my certificate. It's still there in the house. 
but I because later I went I went to look for a job. I started working as a veterinary clinic uh, cl- uh, clinician. I got fed up and tired. I started a farm. I told you. Psalm 15, verse 4. A faithful man is one in whose eyes a vile person is contained, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart and does what and does not change. They are men and women of integrity. If they give you their word, you can count on them. They will not turn back. If they tell you they are coming today, you will see them, they will come. These are men are faithful, are men of integrity. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18. That by two immutable things for which it, is, it was impossible for God to lie. You see, God cannot lie. He can't tell you something and do. God is not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should change his. He doesn't. If his word goes out, he has gone out. He will not come back to him void. He doesn't pretend. He doesn't do anything in order to please you. He's not a, an eye service person. His word is yea and amen. If not, you can't trust him. If not, that's why a lot of people are still struggling. Because they don't know the faithfulness of God. When you think about the faithfulness, he said... Being confident in this one thing, Philippians 1 6. Being confident in this one thing, that he that began a good work in you is what? Is faithful and will do what? Complete it. He doesn't start a job and leave it halfway. He said, A man who wants to build a house will sit down and count the costs and know whether he will finish it when he starts. And not just that you just want to rush into it out of emotions and all of that. Sit down and think through. If you make up your mind, that is why if before you can be faithful, you see, one thing that you do, you have to say bye-bye to all this. Number two, you have to be convinced. It is conviction that drives you. Is your conviction that drives you. A lot of people are not convinced in this thing that we're doing as a church, as a, as a Christian. We are not convinced in Jesus Christ. Paul said, this is, he, he said in Romans chapter 8 verse 18, he said, 18, yes, he said, I am persuaded, I am convinced that there is no trouble in this life. He is worthy to become, he said they are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be. There is something beyond faith. His conviction, I am convinced in this thing. And if you are convinced in anything, you are ready to die for it. You are ready to go all the way. You know, the problem is that we are not convinced in this thing that we are doing. You are not convinced in your faith in Christ. You are not convinced on that rock upon which you are standing. Conviction. That is why even when they batter you, kill you, do everything you are saying, if you have any blood, it is that conviction that will spawn life. Quicken. Paul, when they beat him, he said they at a point, they threw him and beat him and they thought he was dead. They left him. Is that conviction that jacked him again back to life? He got up and kept moving. When Prophet Agabus now gave a prophecy about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, and he saw it that he was going to be arrested, and this and said it's going to happen to him. What did he say? He said, "Not none of those things, but that because I was convinced." It was like Job. I know my believer, my deliver, my my my. My redeemer live. I know my redeemer live. You know what Paul said? I know in whom I am, I believe. Convi- he's, he's not your knowledge, he's conviction. He's talking about conviction. Faithfulness. You become a die hard. They are the ones that are called faithful. So let's go to gentleness. Another word for gentleness is meekness. 
What is gentleness? What is meekness? Gentleness or meekness? What it is? I have the power to destroy you. I have the strength to finish you. I have what it takes. Do you know who I am? You know I can, just like Pilate said to Jesus Christ, do you know I have the power to do what I want to do with you? Having the power and the strength to do it, but you put it under control, you are not using it. I can beat you up, but I decide not. I can sue you for this thing that you did, but I will not do it. I can jail you, but I will not do it. I can, I can give the instruction that nothing goes to you again, nothing moves from here to you, but I will not do it. Power under control, I don't want to use it. You're meek, you're gentle. So when you see somebody who is greater than you, God, he doesn't use his power and his right and authority on you. He just meek. And meekness is not weakness. Because when you are meek, you don't use your, they slap you on this side. You know you can fight back. You know some women, you know women who feel that they are, their husband is talking. The next thing is, boy, slap your husband. Is it that your husband cannot kill you? Break you into shreds? You beat and beat, he will just keep quiet. You slap, he will keep quiet. And you, the more he keeps quiet, you feel that uh, uh, you slap him again, he keep quiet. You slap him again, he keep. You push him, he fell down, and he will just be laughing. It's not that he cannot destroy you. It's meekness. That is called gentleness. And you take his meekness for granted. You take that meekness for granted. And that is what we do with God. Because God is meek. So we take him for granted. That is why you do all those things you do that he told you not to do. You sleep around, you, you steal, you falsify figures and all of that. Instead of that hammer coming on your head, he just patient. He just leaves you. Looking and waiting for you to change. His kindness towards you. That gentleness it was. The end result is so that you can repent. But what do we do? We take God for granted. You know it is not good for you to come late to church. You take God for granted. You keep in it. The, the things that he said that he was going to do to you and all of that, he will just keep quiet. So the Bible says... The reason why men's hearts are set to do evil is because of what? God is slow to bring his judgment. So men's hearts are set to do evil. They take God for granted. And that is what we do. So you see, that is why if you're going to deal with God and walk with God, one thing you must have is the fear. Of, if you don't fear God, tremble at his word. That thing that he say, obey it and keep it. You will break those laws. He will keep quiet. That he keeps quiet does not mean that he is not doing anything, not going to do anything. He is just waiting for you and giving you patience and time and all of that to repent and change. You take him for granted. But guess what? There is a time grace expires, but he's going to give you long opportunity. That's called long suffering. How long? God's own long suffering is too long. So you see it in um, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. First Peter chapter 3, verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of what? A meek 
and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great price. Meek and quiet is meek. That is a gentle person. You say this woman is a gentle woman. It's not only men that are gentle men. Gentle men and gentle women. They have their strength under control. Something bad to them. In the spirit of meekness, they correct the person. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Forgiving faults, correct faults and rules their spirit. He said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of what? Meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Is a gentle man. He's not the one that, uh -huh, why did you do it? This one is going to happen to you. This other one, we're going to deal with you. We're going to decide. I have opportunity to get back at you. Or then you are now beginning to talk about it and begin to castigate and begin to spread all kinds of hey, can't you see yeah, so and so person was seen, so and so that's why he's following. And what he's saying is true, but we are castigating them. You are not a gentle person. And guess what? You are going to be you are going to fall into that same temptation when the time comes. Let's look at the last one, I think. That's called self-control. What is self-control? Self-control is one who has a rule over his spirit, over himself. You have control over yourself. You are able to control your thoughts, bring it under subjection, bring it under captivity, your thoughts. Your actions, you are, they are under, you have checkmated them. You provoke this person and say, do all the, all everything to provoke him, to get, to get him to angry because he wants to, he wants, he provokes you, you, you know, when you act out of anger, you are going to either say something wrong or do something wrong, but the person keeps himself because there are things that you say under provocation. When you repent and all of that, you, there are damage that you have made, you will not be able to rectify it. That's why they say there are mistakes you make with pencil and there are some you make with biro. They are not easily corrected. The one that made with pencil, uh, biro. So you have to be careful. You have, that's why Paul said, I put my body under. That's why he said, I die daily. Dying daily is a putting, is a put self control. Control yourself, control your emotion, control your anger, control your desires, con control the thoughts that goes on, control your actions, the desire, the lust of the flesh and all that. Put them under. The Bible says in Romans 8, 13, it says, if you live in the flesh, you will die. But if you through the spirit mortify, the word mortify means to subject, to subdue. The word mortify means to put under. That's the meaning of the word mortify. Put it under you, under your feet. Subdue it. And you can do it by the help of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 25 verse 28. Finally, he that had no rule over his own spirit is like what? A city that is broken down and without what? The one that does not have control over his spirit. That is anything. Your every slightest thing you, you are provoked. And the slightest provocation. He say one thing, just crack jokes or whatever. You flare up every little. You are just a time bomb. And somebody, you know who I am. You know me. So it's a no-go area. You know me now. You know when I start. Is a time bomb. And they pride in their flesh. Okay, finally, generally, how do we build, how can we ensure that these fruits are 
evident in our life. Now that we know what they are, how can we ensure that they are evident in our life? One, I'm going to show you in John, two things you're going to do. Number one, John chapter 15 verse 5. If you want to ensure that you are growing and growing in the fruit of the Spirit, manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, wanting, there are two things you must do. Number one, John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine. Take this very seriously. I am the vine. You are the what? The branches. He that abided in me and I in him. The same thing, the same one does what? Well, bring it forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branch. I actually forgot to bring a plant. I would have wanted to bring a plant that has a trunk, a tree, and the leaf on it, the one that has fruit. The fruit comes from the branch, but the source of that fruit. The thing that supplies the things that that fruit, the branch needs to produce fruit, it comes from the vine. So what it means is that there are things that are moving from, you are not seeing it with your naked eyes. There are vessels, they call it just like you have blood vessels in the human being. There are vessels in the plant. They are called xylem and phlegm. Okay? Xylem and phlegm. They are, they are means through which mineral resources and nutrients goes through the trunk or the vine and then gets to the branches and then offers that privilege to produce that fruit. That there is a flow. That is why if you want to kill a tree, what you need to do is that use a 12 inches nail, depending on how big the trunk is, and drive it into the tree. And when it gets to the middle of that tree, it blocks the flow. It causes a reaction that is going to block the flow of those nutrients. And the life of that thing, anything that is up, will die. So that is why if you don't maintain... So now the fruit, remember it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is not your spirit that is bearing that fruit. Your spirit doesn't have that fruit. It is the Holy Spirit. So if you maintain a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, that fruit will continue to come. If you maintain a fellowship with the Spirit of God, you are guaranteed of that fruit. If you don't maintain fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you will not have that fruit. And that is the reason why the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but being filled with the Holy Ghost. These are the fundamental, the basis teachings and all of that. That's where, so if you don't know how to maintain a spirit field, like how can you be a Christian? How can you be a child of God? How can you attain to the fullness of God and all of that? It's a waste of time. So you see, people who don't have fellowship, we don't pray, who don't fellowship with Jesus Christ, who don't have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, whose fellowship with Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit is once in a while. Once in a blooming, once in a week, once in a month. And even when they do it, they do it hurriedly. Anyhow, anyhow. You're not going to get anything out of it. That is why you see a Christian born again. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. But he's still living a dry life. You are still angry. You are still hurting. You still keep malice. You still... Somebody does something to you, you stop whatever, whatever it is that you're doing with the person and all of that, all those things. The reason is because you're not bearing that fruit. And the reason why you're not bearing fruit is because you're not maintaining a fellowship with the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 1 9. See what you are called to do. 1 Corinthians 1 9. Please fast. Fast, please. God is what? Faithful. By whom you, we are called unto who? Unto fellowship. That is what we are called. Fellowshipping with Jesus. And fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. How do you fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Praises. 
worship, thanksgiving. That's how you have fellowship. Prayer, praying in the Holy Ghost. How do you maintain fellowship with Jesus Christ? Through the studying of the word. Jesus is the word of God. You study his word. Allow his, he said, let my word abide in you. If my word abide in you and I in you, I am the vine and you are the branch. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit will be cut down. But if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall bear much fruit. The studying of the word of God, meditating on the word of God, reflecting on the word of God. This is how it is. It's not a rocket science. It's not an addition. It is a must. You must imbibe this in your life. The second thing that you must do, you must weed your garden. You know that tree, your plant. You know if you leave it, thorns are going to grow. True or false? You must make sure that your garden is kept weed free. Weed your garden. Avoid every appearances of what? Evil. Avoid it. Ensure Don't just get into every kind of discussion. Somebody just come around you, you want to start gossiping. Don't listen. Shun that person down. Leave that discussion. Don't get involved. Because God hates those who plant seed of discord. So you maintain fellowship with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ. I've told you what it means to maintain fellowship. You pray in the Spirit. And then you make sure that your garden is clean. Those of them who are immoral, there are those, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, he said there are those you don't have to have fellowship with. It. Because evil communication the corrupt good manners. Anyone that you come in contact and is not helping you cultivate this. You are not, when you come in contact with that person, your life is dried up. You are not, you are not geared towards worshipping God or serving God or loving God. When you come in contact with such a person and all of that, you notice that your flair for God, your joy for God and your love for God and all of that goes down. Avoid that person. Because that person is a minus in your life. Amen. I rest my case. Did we get anything? We have done service, the Christian service, and we have done the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So, tomorrow is Thursday. We are going to do the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the one you must hear. We've been hearing the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you find out, you will find out tomorrow that most of you are you the, the gift of the Holy Ghost is operating in your life because but because you don't know. Because it, because you don't know what it is, you can't take advantage of it. Because you have to know how it operates. And when you know it, you find out that it has been operated. Hey, ah, pastor, do you know no wonder is happening? And uh... so tomorrow we deal with the fruit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And after that, the next one you, you will chew. Make sure if you are coming after that, the next class, get yourself ready. Get yourself because you will cry. Some of you will hate me. Is a the crucified life. <laughs> I'm going to crucify you that day. 
from the word of God. You will cry. You will not like me. Because I won't call your name, but this the scripture I'm going to read for you. For those of you who want to, you know there are three sets of the crucified life. There is-